Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to today's presentation, Christian-Muslim Relations, Implications for Jews in Israel. My name is Dexter Van Zyl, and I'm going to be your host for this afternoon. Our speaker today is Reverend Dr. Mark Dury. Reverend Dury is a theologian, author, Anglican pastor, senior research fellow at the Arthur Jeffrey Center for the Study of Islam at the Melbourne School of Theology, and he is also the director of the Institute for Spiritual Awareness. He has published many articles and books on linguistics, Islam, Christian-Muslim relations, and religious freedom. He has held visiting appointments at the University of Leiden and is a Harkness Fellow at MIT, UCLA, and Stanford. After Reverend Dury's presentation, we will proceed with a question and answer period with written questions, and we want to hear from your questions. If you run your cursor at the, along the bottom of your screen on Zoom, you'll see an icon for Q&A. Click on that icon so that you can submit your questions during the talk. And so let's begin. Good afternoon, Reverend Dory. Good afternoon, Dexter. It's great to, great to be with you. Um, well, I'd like to share with you today about how um, certain important but difficult characteristics of the relationship between uh, Christianity and Islam have impacted upon the security of Israel and also uh, upon the Jews. Um, I, at one point, I thought of calling this talk the monotheistic maze, uh, because it is a very complex set of relationships that we're dealing with. Um, it's as though key players are trapped in a cruel maze and it's hard for them to get out of it. And in my, in my presentation, I want to bring three ideas forward. One is that the Quran and the um, example of, and teaching of Muhammad are um, hardwired anti-Semitic. Secondly, um, Christians have since the beginning wanted to ha have a sympathy with Islam and to see um, a kind of Christian base or core to Islam, which has influenced their relationship with the Quran and with Islam. And thirdly, um, uh, Christians and Jews both have lived uh, in a very damaging uh, relationship of uh, being subjugated peoples under Islam, and that's affected the continuing relationship today. Well, the relationship between Jews and Christians, and on the one hand, and Islam on the other, was uh, contested from the very beginning. And there are numerous uh, references in the Quran to disputes which took place between um, the early Muslims and Jews and Christians. Uh, Jews and Christians, interestingly, are, are treated by the Quran as a single category, the people of the book. And um, in the earlier chapters, the Quran is somewhat positive about the people of the book, it had expectations, I think, that they would um, affirm the calling of the prophet of Islam. But in the end, the last word of the Quran about the people of the book is negative. Um, I'd like to bring up just a, a few slides which uh, will help um, bring this into focus. Um, so the Quran uh, has a vision, really, that all religions would be subjugated to Islam. So Surah 933 says, He it is, Allah has sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth, that is Islam, so that he may cause it to prevail or to triumph over all religions. So there's a vision or a hope that Islam will come to triumph over other religions. Or well, Surah 2, 193 from the Quran, fight them until there's no persecution, which is understood in the Quranic context as nothing that would reject or undermine Islam. And the religion is Allah's. So religion is, is basically Islamic. And Surah 385, whoever desires a religion other than Islam, it will not be accepted of him. And for centuries, Islam's program of dominance, a desire to be uh, to prevail over other faiths, was extraordinarily successful. In the first thousand years, there was military expansion across the Mediterranean, Africa, Western Europe, uh, in Andalusia, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Indeed, indeed even in the very first century, there was extraordinary um, expansion uh, that uh, uh, really occupied a very significant part of the Christian world. This con these conquests were not sort of accidental or, or defensive acts. They were, they were expansionary, theologically driven acts. And 
it's absolutely clear from the Quran itself that Islam was birthed in opposition to Christianity and Judaism. But it's really striking that the, um, the Jews attracted uh, the more intense uh, judgments in the Quran. But before I go into those verses, I just wanted to give you a different map of the Mediterranean that shows the Pentarchy, the, the five um, patriarchates, patriarchates of the of the Mediterranean. This was based in Alexandria, Antioch, Constantinople, um, Rome, and Jerusalem. So the Christian world was thought of as being divided into these five regions. And ultimately, four of those five ancient centers, with the exception of Rome, were conquered by Islam. But to get back to the Quran, as I said, um, the, the final word of the Quran is very negative about the people of the book but it's particularly bad about um, Jews. And I want to take you through some of the verses of the Quran, uh, which engage with the issue of the Jews. First of all, the first verse, first chapter of the Quran, very short, is part of the daily prayers of all Muslims, al-Fatiha, the opening it's called. And it includes the verse, guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have blessed, not the path of those on whom your anger falls. And that's intended, understood to be the Jews, according to Muhammad, nor those who go astray, the Christians. So you see in this verse already, the Jews are under the wrath of God and the Christians have gone astray. So Jews are in a, in a worse state from, a, from an Islamic perspective. And there are a whole lot of verses that have very uh, condemning and critical things to say about the Jews. We'll just go through um, a list of them. I think it's important to note the details. Um, Surah 5. Muslims will find that the most violent of people in enmity, that is hatred to the believers, to Muslims, are the Jews and the idolaters. Um, Christians will be closer in affection. Uh, Surah 446, Jews are cursed, and very few of them are genuine believers. Um, they vilify Islam. They're cursed for their disbelief. Um, Jews are repeatedly many times called killers of prophets. Humiliation and poverty were stamped on them and they incurred their anger, the wrath of God. That's because they disbelieved in the signs of God and they killed the prophets without any right. They disobeyed. They went on transgressing. Um, Jews are called covenant breakers. Uh, we, Allah says he cursed them and he made their hearts ha hard. They change, they switch words around. They're treacherous. Um, uh, Jews have knowingly concealed the truth. They're covenant breakers. They, they cause corruption on the earth. Both David and Jesus, Jesus cursed the unbelieving Jews. Jews will only love a Muslim if he converts to Judaism. Allah has changed Jews into monkeys, into apes in the past. In Surah 564, it says the Jews are cursed warmongers. They say they, they malign God and say his hand is chained. I'm not quite certain what that was about. Um, but um, God actually causes them to be even more hardened in their transgression and their disbelief, and they have hatred and enemy cast among them from God. They keep lighting the fire of war, and God puts it out. They cause corruption on the earth. Um, their associators, they say Allah has a son. It's, that's the only unforgivable sin in, his, in the Quran. According to the Quran, Muslims should not be friends with Jews. Jews claim they killed the Messiah. Jews love this life. They don't care about the next. This is really interesting. Um, the Quran says about the Jews is that they, they um, if they were really on God's side, they'd want death. They'd love death because that would take them to paradise. But actually they don't. And they, uh, they, they're evildoers. So they try and hang on to life at all costs. And they're, they're terrified of death, basically. Um, now, that was the Quran, but Muhammad also said many things about the Jews, which are in, which is part of what's called the Sunnah, or the path of Muhammad. He said at one point in Medina, kill any Jew who falls in your power. And when he was about to attack Khaybar, I've spelled that wrongly, um, he, he was asked by Ali, his um, relative, why are we fighting these Jews in Khaybar? And he said, fight them until they bear testament to the fact that there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, that is, until they convert to Islam. And when they do that, their blood and their riches are safe from your hands. But if they don't, um, their blood, their, their lives and their possessions are, are available to you to take. There was the genocide of the remaining tribe of Jews in Medina and the military attack, killing and enslaving of Jews in Khaybar. There's also a tradition of Muhammad that says the judgment day won't come until the Muslims fight the Jews. The Jews will hide behind stones and trees and the trees will say, oh, Muslim servant of Allah. There's a Jew behind me, come and kill him. 
Now, um, it's somewhat confronting to uh, to think about these verses, and I've sort of poured upon you a torrent of this this material from the Quran, and it is as disturbing as it, as as it is. You know, it's it's uh, very concerning that the Quran contains with it in inside it a whole series of these libels. Um, and they're not just dead letters from ancient books. They shape and drive contemporary religious views and practices. For example, they've been on show very recently um, in the conflict between Hamas and the IDF. During that time, many Muslim preachers were repeating these libels from the Quran. Um, for example, in a session in Jordanian parliament, one MP, Safa Momani, called for all agreements for Israel to be cancelled. Why? because the Jews are slayers of prophets. That's a Quranic claim. And they betray all acts and, and covenants that they enter into. That's also in the Quran. You can't trust them to have a peace treaty. Another MP, Suleiman Abu Yahya, said that Allah's cursed the Jews. Again, that's from the Quran. And they fear the Palestinians more than they fear Allah. This is also a theme from the Quran. The Jews um, love this life. They, they don't love death. And also disbelievers in general, the Quran says, um, fear, fear death and they uh, fear Muslims. Um, but true Muslims, they go forth to fight, uh, not fearing death, says the Quran. Another MP, Salama al Bui, said that Zionists are sons of apes and pigs. That's a, in the Quran. Um, Allah has supposedly changed uh, Jews into apes and pigs. And it's what I find really interesting about this kind of session of the Jordanian parliament where there was all this hatred of Jews put forth is that every single um, theme that was put forward by these members of parliament came from the Quran. They were, they were repeating the material of their Friday sermons that they had heard over the years. And the point about these libels is that they prolong the war because they can, these lies condition Muslims to believe the Jews are weak fearful and will inevitably be destroyed and Allah is against them and their losers. And this is a message that continually reinvigorates the jihad. Now, um, how should Christians respond to Islamic anti-Semitism that's grounded in the Quran? And that is very, uh, I've just given you one example of, of those members of parliament. There've been many, many Muslim leaders that have kind of trotted out these tropes in, in, in recent weeks. And it happens, it happens, it's been happening for, centuries so since the beginning actually how do christians respond to islamic anti-semitism from the quran and the life of muhammad well this is a really interesting question um from the beginning a standard christian take on islam was that it it was a heretical sect gone wrong um that goes back to a, a, a legend about a monk called bahira and in some versions sergius who supposedly taught muhammad christianity but um, Muhammad somehow lost his way on Christianity. And so this view of Islam that many Christians have is that Islam is a kind of lost Christianity, but there are sort of good bones in there somewhere that can be restored or brought back to life. And so some Christians want to discern the biblical truth in Islam, and they even devote their whole lives to seeking that out, out of a sympathy for Islam. And this, this, this way of treating Islam as a kind of Christian heresy has become entangled also with the, the problem of the Islamic Sharia and particularly the Dhimma system. So after, con after the conquests, um, the Dhimma system, the Dhimma means a covenant of surrender. Um, this was implemented as part of Islamic law by Muslim conquerors over the heads of Jews and Christians. And the status of Jews and Christians living under Islam was governed by a covenant of surrender in which the conquered peoples owed a duty of uh, compensation to their Muslim conquerors, compensation for not being killed and not being looted and enslaved and raped. Um, and a key feature of this was an annual um, tribute payment that the men had to pay. But there were also a whole lot of demeaning laws which trapped non-Muslims in an inferior position and a very vulnerable position. And if non-Muslims broke any of those laws, uh, for example, a Christian man marrying a, or trying to marry a Muslim woman would be an example of a breach of those laws. Um, this would cause, it could cause the restart of the jihad, the restart of violence and enslavement, massacres and death. And over the centuries, there have been periodic massacres of non-Muslim um, communities um, 
usually in response to the perception that they have overstepped the boundaries of their inferior status. The Jews in Granada were massacred in 1066. In all through the 19th century, there were a series of massacres of Christians and sometimes Jews as well uh, throughout the Middle East, including in Damascus and Aleppo in 1860. And the justification with the violence was that the Christians were not keeping their pact of surrender properly. So this, this oppressive system of dominance regulated by the Islamic Sharia caused a kind of suspended animation for the Emir communities. They were trapped in a sort of time warp of being the permanently conquered peoples. Um, but at worst, there would be a very serious demographic decline when sometimes large numbers of Christians would abandon their faith in, and embrace Islam in order to, to avoid the burden of the, of the tribute payments and also their legal inferiority. Now, one of the casualties of the Dhimma system for the conquered church was um, a poverty of intellectual engagement with Islam. Um, the Pact of Umar, which is an early version of the Dhimma Pact of Surrender, has as one of its most interesting and in a way peculiar conditions that Christians were forbidden from teaching their children about the Quran, which you might think is a strange idea. But I think the intention was that the conquered peoples should not comprehend or critique the spiritual and ideological stronghold that was um, formed against them. They should not understand Islam. There's a very interesting report by um, Johannes Janssen, who was a, a Dutch Arabist, who when he was younger was seeking to um, do a PhD. And he had this great idea that he could do a PhD on... Um, on what the Coptic church had written about Islam. So he said, when I was still young and naive while studying in Egypt, I requested an audience with a Coptic bishop to inquire after books about Islam written by theologians of the Coptic church, then explains the history of the church in Egypt. He said, it seemed unthinkable to me that Coptic theologians hadn't pondered Islam and there wouldn't be any books or articles about Islam from their vantage point. A great topic, he thought actually for, for dissertation. But within three seconds, the bishop had set me straight. No, there are no such books, he said. This is really extraordinary that a, a church with such a rich intellectual tradition would have nothing to say about Islam. But it was a deliberate uh, creation of the Dhimma that uh, Christians were not supposed to critique the conditions of their, um, their capture. Now, the other thing about the Dhimma is that uh, it did nothing to improve Christian Jewish relations already affected by Christian anti-Semitism in the Byzantine period. Um, things were made worse because of the divide and rule effect of the Vimmer, in which Christians would be incited against each other, one sect against another, and also against the Jews as a survival strategy. There's a saying in Arabic, after Saturday comes Sunday, um, which is basically Muslims will deal with the Jews first and then the Christians. But at times, uh, the Christians have been willing to welcome Saturday in the hope that Sunday might never come. And there are multiple reports in, of Christian antipathy towards Jews in the Levant, in the, in the area around um, Palestine uh, under Muslim rule. So during the 19th and 20th centuries, local Christian communities across the Middle East published blood libels against local Jews, saying Jews had mingled you know, Christian blood in their sacrifices. There was the Protocols of the Elders of Zion that was first translated by Christians in Syria in the 19th century. Um, it was also, I think, highly symbolic that under Ottoman rule, Christians in Jerusalem assisted on the, insisted on their right to beat and even kill any Jew who strayed into the entrance of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And a more recent example have been periodic statements by Coptic popes denouncing Israel. So Pope Shenouda III, opposed the normalization of relations between Israel and Egypt. He banned Coptic Christians from going on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And he said, I will never go to Jerusalem except hand in hand with my Muslim brothers after the end of Israeli occupation. So one of the factors that I think has influenced Christian uh, antipathy, Vimy Christian antipathy to the Jews has been a lack of ability to engage critically with Islam and also the, um, the impact of the, of the Dhimma conditions, the imperative to survive. And, the, and so this made Dhimmi Christians very um, poorly equipped to be able to challenge Islamic anti-Semitism. 
Now, at the same time, the West, um, leaders in the West have had some real blind spots about Islam. And that's always been really interesting to me to understand what those blind spots are and why they exist. Um, there has been a really interesting tradition of Christian fellow travelers, I think I would call them, to Islam, who have a sympathy for Islam and discern a kind of kindred monotheism in the faith of Muhammad. There's been a series of Anglican ministers um, who've been scholars uh, who've had that approach. So, for example, Kenneth Bishop Kenneth Cragg adopted for himself a, a mission of retrieval, as he called it, trying to conjure up Christianity from Islam's foundations. Uh, Montgomery Watt was another one. Um, and the, the people in this tradition, Western scholars, have uh, turned a blind eye to Islamic anti-Semitism. They would, they would not give the kind of talk, you know, survey that I just gave you in a few minutes at the start of this talk. And even today, Christian leaders who are known for boldly denouncing Israel won't utter a word about Islamic anti-Semitism. And they can even spread information that's not true. For example, uh, Reverend Colin Chapman made a scandalous claim at a, at a Christ at the Checkpoint conference that the Arab conflict with Israel had nothing to do with the doctrine of jihad until decades, uh, you know, after it had started. Um, it's just completely false. It's a fantasy. <laughs> but he wanted to downplay the religious motivations for, he didn't acknowledge the religious motivations on the Arab side for their conflict with Israel. And to be fair, sometimes Jewish scholars have had a similar blind spot. Bernard Lewis stated in his book, The Jews of Islam, that, I quote, in Islamic society, hostility to the Jew is non-theological. It is not related to any specific Islamic doctrine, nor to the, any specific circumstance of Islamic sacred history. Apparently, Muhammad um, beheading 800 Jews wasn't a circumstance in Islamic sacred history. For Muslims, Bernard Lewis said, it's not part of the birth pangs of their religion, as it is for Christians. I mean, this is a fantastic and absolutely false claim that Bernard Lewis, who's a highly intelligent and highly respected scholar, for, deservedly so, made in, in, in a, you know, a, a sort of flagship book about the status of Jews under Islam. Then you also have the application of liberation theology to the conflict, fueled by these blind spots um, from some Christians. For example, the work of the Nabil Center aligns with this approach. Middle Eastern Christians, some of them seek to delegitimize Israel, effectively in support of the jihad, which interestingly is a duty of faithful service, which the the them a pact demand, demanded of them. Uh, and at the same time, they will not expose uh, Islamic anti-Semitism as, as an actual driver of the conflict. So as, um, as we've seen in recent weeks, if, if you've been reading the reports from memory and other sources, there's been a whole flood of uh, Quranic anti-Semitic tropes from Islamic preachers and politicians and leaders in recent weeks, stirred up by the conflict happening between Hamas and Israel. And what I find really interesting about these, these reports is that there's so little analysis in Western mainstream media of the religious motivations of this hatred. Yes, there are reports of anti-Semitic attacks on Jews, even including in the West, and they've been in main, mainstream papers, but there's been no analysis of the Quranic roots of Islamic anti-Semitism, even when it's been clearly displayed for the world to see. So let me just summarize and make some comments about the future. What I've been describing in a way is a perfect storm of a combination of different factors. One is um, the reality of uh, antipathy towards the Jews in Islam's core texts. The second is the impact of the Vimma, of the covenant of surrender upon uh, Christians in particular who've lived under Islam and the uh, the pressure that that has exerted on them to need, just need to survive, and part of that has been to adopt an anti-Jewish stance. And thirdly, the tendency within Christianity to, and some Christians to look for Christ in Islam, to look for Christianity in Islam, treating it, Islam as a kind of Christian heresy, Christianity that's lost its way and needs to be somehow retrieved or restored. And this goes along with a sympathy with Islam. And these factors sort of work together to um, create this, this, this maze, <laughs> this trap, uh, which, which makes it hard for people to see the truth clearly, let alone love faithfully, as Christians are called to do. 
So the Emi Christians have been conditioned by centuries of abuse to overlook and even endorse uh, Islamic anti-Semitism. Ultimately, the strategy of taking a stance against the Jews for the Emi Christians, Christians living under Islamic conditions, ultimately will fail because Saturday does come before Sunday. It's, it's at best encouraging Islamic anti-Semitism or partnering with it only buys a postponement of the of the struggle against Christians, which the, the Quran in the end also calls for. In the end, the Quran treats um, uh, Christians and Jews, or the Jews get the, the worst deal. It treats them as the same category. Um, and the Western desire to, to find a Christian core in Islam, I think is fundamentally displayed, uh, misplaced. It's, it's, a, it's a deception, a, a deep deception. And Islam, in my understanding, is not a biblical faith. It's not in the same tradition of Abraham. And it has very different foundations, actually, theological foundations. It has lots of Christian and Jewish bits and pieces in it, but it's not grounded on a biblical worldview. So one of the effects of all this is that key opinion makers, Christian opinion makers, turn a blind eye to the anti-Semitism of the Quran. And um, it hasn't helped that people on the left in Western nations at the present time tend to see Muslims as victims. And uh, that makes it even harder for them to really properly engage with the ideological challenge. At its heart, Muslim hatred of Israel is deeply influenced by the anti-Jewish rhetoric of the Quran and the Sunnah. The Jordanian parliamentarians' comments reflect that very, very clearly, for example, but they're just one of many examples. Um, what about the future? How, what is there a way forward? Um, well, I think Christians have a responsibility, I would say, as a Christian before God, to call out anti-Jewish hatred. Um, they have to reject such uh, a traditional way of thinking and they have to do it really clearly and uh, and without kind of any kind of squeamish uh, kind of uncomfortableness about acknowledging the reality of these things. And I think an any Christian dialogue with Islam ultimately has to engage with this issue as well, Islam's rejection of the people of the book, both Christians and Jews. If Islamic anti-Semitism is not confronted and acknowledged, then Islam's inherent antipathy towards Christians and their faith will stand unchallenged too, because in the end, uh, Islam's policy for the people of the book is a single policy. Um, Western churches also need to be equipped to understand that compassion for Middle Eastern Christians doesn't mean that we should buy into anti-Jewish tropes. For example, that the Jews are cruel, that they're deceptive or warmongering. This is just the Quran speaking. And we shouldn't buy into those lies. Um, this would be like blindly accepting a battered woman's praise of her husband because she's got no other choice but than to praise him. And to believe such praise would be a terrible error, you know, if you understood that she was actually in, a, in an abusive relationship. And I think it's the same that we, we shouldn't blindly accept Middle Eastern Christian testimony without understanding the context in which it's generated. We also have a challenge as Christians to tell the truth in love. And I think the, um, the desire to see Christianity somehow reflected in the heart of Islam, as if in some dark mirror, mustn't be allowed to silence reasonable acknowledgement of the truth and a critique of Islam's own obsessive age-old hatreds. Israel's survival depends upon its continued ability to withstand and defeat the jihad forever, I believe. On the other hand, um, the jihadis' hope to annihilate Israel is constantly renewed by the Quran and its lies about the Jews. For example, that they love life more than death, or that they're warmongers, or that they're the source of all corruption on the earth. These religious roots do need to be countered. Um, ultimately, an enduring peace can only come when Muslims no longer find a way um, to reject, or, sorry, it, it, it can only come when Muslims find a way to either reject directly or to sideline and uh, compartmentalize the anti-Semitism of the Quran and the Sunnah. Some, for some, this will happen through pragmatism, I think, as we've seen in the Abraham Accords. And some Muslims are moving in this direction and, and more need to follow. This needs to be encouraged. Um, it also needs to be emphasized that for Muslims to adopt these anti-Semitic positions is very suicidal. It, it causes bitterness 
it's self-destructive, it distracts Muslims from getting on with improving their own situation. Um, the hope of shedding Jewish blood is no answer to the plight of the Muslim world. And finally, um, the, uh, an Islamic retreat from anti-Jewish themes, which is really necessary, uh, can hardly be expected to be overcome as long as Christian leaders are silent about this strand of Islamic thought and do not acknowledge the legacy of the Quran uh, in this area. That is um, the conclusion of my presentation. And uh, I now hand back to the Dexter for some discussion or comments. We can't hear you, Dexter. I got to unmute myself. That's probably <laughs> most people I think are happy when I'm muted. But uh, I, that was a wonderful presentation. And one of the things that I liked about it was is that it was irenic. You know, an awful lot of the times uh, when people talk about these issues, uh, sometimes they have a tendency to kind of froth at the mouth and undermine, uh, you know, from the perspective, they undermine the, the, their own delivery or their own message with their own aggressiveness. And uh, but the thing is, is that you speak about these terms and these issues, these very difficult issues in such irenic and, uh, and and comprehensive and rational ways that I think it's very, very, very powerful. It's, it's very good. And you mentioned briefly the Ag Abraham Accords. Can you talk more about what you think about the how the Abraham Accords are going to affect uh, the practice of Islam or, or, or the way that they in, interpret their anti-Jewish polemics in the Quran and, and in the Hadith? Well, this is the move in some Muslim nations to normalize relations with Israel and not to treat Israel as a pariah state, but to engage economically and in other ways socially with, the, with Israel. And it's, it's forced upon, in some ways, cynically, you might say it's being forced upon Sunni states because of the threat of, of Iran. Um, and the, the great pressure the Sunnis are feeling from from the from the Iranians, um, it's. Uh, I think there was a uh, a huge response a few decades back by the Muslim world to reject Israel and to hope for its demise. And and I think pragmatically they've come to see that, that it isn't happening. Not only is it not happening, but Israel is flourishing while the rest of the Middle East is is getting worse and, and is in terrible crisis. So it's become kind of pragmatically necessary for. Muslim nations to stop this futile battle that's getting them nowhere and it's just causing one defeat after another, despite the empty claims of victory. And so um, I think that's wonderful. And look, we'll cause a softening of the of the rhetoric. Um, the, you know, a number of my friends who've left Islam over the years have said that part of their Islamic formation was ritual prayers cursing Jews at the end of the Friday prayers in the mosque. And those sort of practices um, will have to decline, you know, if the state, it, what happens in Islamic um, uh, context is that the rulers uh, have a lot of influence upon what the the, peop the the preachers will say in the mosques. And and this sort of change will impact uh, on the, um, it's a virtuous, hopefully a virtuous circle that there'll be a reduction in the rhetoric. And at the same time, um, the uh, the more peaceful relations will will uh, will will endure. So I have good hopes for the future. There will be more of these agreements between Israel and other states. Right now, what should our attitude be towards Christians who live in Muslim majority envi environments who condemn Israel? You know, I I, I think, thought, yeah. What do you think? Well, I think compassion. Yeah, I think um, we have to understand what it's like for your ancestors, generation after generation, to live on the verge of massacre and of rape and abduction of women um, and, and expropriation of property, public humiliation, stones being thrown at, at people without recourse. I mean, this is very damaging psychologically. And so we need to, uh, we need to see that in that context. So I would say with compassion, but not with credulity, we shouldn't just buy into um, the campaigns that they're presenting. I have once had an interaction with the Bishop of Jerusalem, the Anglican Bishop who was visiting Australia, and he, he spoke at great length to a committee I was part of about how abusive this, the Israelis were to him, you know, he was being searched when he went through airports and so on. And I said, look, you know, Bishop, you're, I know your people are suffering from their Muslim neighbours, 
And I mentioned a number of issues and he said, oh, yes, he said, but what can we do about that? <laughs> and so his testimony was, he was attacking the safest thing he could attack, which was Israel. But he was saying nothing about his Muslim neighbors. That was too dangerous. He'd been too conditioned over generations not to do that. And so, you know, um, we, we shouldn't be credulous and just accept the testimony. It's a testimony of a, of a really highly traumatized people. Yeah. Now, now, how can we remain true to the fifth Christian faith during interfaith dialogue with Muslims? How do we do that? I think we need to understand Islam profoundly. We need to understand that Islam projects certain uh, requirements upon that dialogue uh, that are favorable to its advance and that we should not necessarily accept. Um, for example, I don't think we should blindly accept the Abrahamic frame that Islam offers or even that we all worship the same God. Um, that bridge that Islam offers is a bridge designed to draw people into Islam. And I'm not saying we should be rude, but um, we don't have to agree on theology in order to have an effective dialogue with Muslims. So, but we won't get to that point unless we understand Islam. One of the problems is that Islam contains within it a very robust and challenging apologetic against Christianity. But Christianity, Christians, so any Muslim, a young Muslim would have an apologetic against Christianity as part of their worldview. But Christians don't have the same, and they don't know how to answer those um, those. Uh, challenges that Islam brings up. So Christians need to equip themselves, really. They need to understand them. I mean, I've, I've been working on this for 20 years to try and equip the church to understand Islam better so that we can engage truthfully and in love as well. And I must say, I, I'm strongly in favour of uh, interfaith dialogue with Muslims and, and not just about religious issues, but partnering together on areas of common concern. I'm, you know, I think that's really important, but it should be done from a position of uh, not of ignorance and of uh, vulnerability, really, but of openness and being well informed. Now, I'm going to kind of give a plug for your book, uh, one of your books, and I will show later the other book uh, that most recently you published. But in your book, Revelation, do we worship the same God, uh, Jesus, Holy Spirit, God in Christianity and Islam? You highlight some decisive differences between the God embodied in the Christian faith and Allah as enunciated or described in the Quran. And, um, and I don't know how useful this question is going to be, but how have Muslims responded when you highlight these differences? And I, I have not myself engaged in a lot of dialogue with kind of strongly convinced Muslims. I haven't felt called to that. I mean, my focus has been more on equipping the church. But I have met many Muslims who've left, former Muslims who've left Islam, and for most of them, an apprehension that God was different from what they'd been taught in Islam uh, it was a key part of their journey. So um, they, they, they are very clear that, there is, that they, they saw God very differently from, from, from after they left Islam and changed their faith. Yeah. There's a, I noticed, um, Dexter, there's a question from somewhere um, from uh, Ruth Kaplan. Do you mind if I answer that? Oh, absolutely. I'd love you to answer that question. Yeah. So Ruth says, there's so much interfaith work amongst Jews, Christians, and Muslims. How honestly are these anti-Jewish statements in the Quran confronted? Very important question. And I think, by the way, um, in Christian-Jewish dialogue, there has been, in recent decades, a lot more openness to engage with such things as um, the the uh, anti-Semitic tropes that could be drawn out of the Bible and out of out of the way Paul has been interpreted. This has been really productive in Christian Jewish dialogue. But to my knowledge, I have never known of an interfaith dialogue between Jews, Christians, and Muslims in which the anti-Semitism of the Quran has been uh, confronted and acknowledged. I, I, this is a, it's a no-go um, topic, and that's why I'm speaking about it really. And I think that's very significant and, and highly problematic. Um, Josh Gorfinkel asks, how do contemporary Muslims view the 17th century um, episode of Zavati Zevi, a mystical messiah and his Jewish followers who converted to Islam? I'm not actually, um, I'm not actually uh, aware of that incident. I think the Islamic view is that Christians and Jews should convert to Islam, you know, that that Christians and Christianity and Judaism are corrupted forms of Islam, that 
that Moses and Jesus were Islamic prophets and they brought a pure Islam, which can be found now in the Quran. And so any true Jew or true Christian will recognize the truth of Islam and they will convert to Islam. So Islam's view is that, yes, we worship the same God and you should join us because that's the logical outcome of being a Christian or a Jew. The real, the real Jew, the real Christian is a Muslim. Um, over to you, Dexter. All right. Now, one of the things that we've all, that you kind of alluded to was the whole issue of supersessionism. You know, Christians have a supersessionist attitude, as some Christians have a supersessionist attitude towards Judaism and the Jewish people, and that spills over in their attitudes towards the Jewish state. How should Christians respond to their own supersessionism in light of the fact that Islam has and, and maybe it's putting it politely, a supersessionist attitude towards Christianity and Judaism. How, how, do we, how do Christians navigate that issue? This is a very interesting uh, question. And I think um, I've sometimes wondered whether the Dhimma is a kind of act of judgment against the church for its own anti-Semitism. It's a tragic, tragic thought, actually. Um, the... I think Christians should re re reject the idea that the church has replaced Israel. I think it's a false idea and it's not biblical and they should do it energetically. Um, and I don't think Christians will be well equipped to stand against Islamic replacement theology as long as they hold on to their own. And I think that's one reason why some Christians have not really been um, able to frankly engage with Islam and they misinterpreted and misrepresented because of because of this instead of seeing islam as a replacement program they see it they they themselves feel they can unearth true christianity within islam it's a kind of an inversion of the truth um so yeah i think uh, christians really need to be very firmly understanding and opposed to the supersessionist trend uh, within islam and also within within christianity now, do you have any sense of what uh, Ruth Kaplan also typed another question about what percentage of Muslims are secular so that the Quranic statements are not relevant? And also she asked, can you be a, a secular Muslim? What, what's your gut response to that? Well, I think you can identify as a Muslim and be a fairly secular person without much religious um, uh, content to your worldview. Um, and some Muslims in the West are becoming secularized. And in, the, in, in Muslim states, some have become secularized as well. That many Iranian Iranians have become fairly secularized too. Um, um, I think I'm not sure what percentages are. I think it would vary from country to country. So in some countries, you might find 50% would be fairly strongly committed. In other countries, it'd be much less. So it just depends on the history of the society. But one thing that's also important to understand about the way religion works is that the Quran influences culture over a long period of time. So certain uh, aspects of a Quranic worldview become ultimately part of the culture, which, which are sustained even when um, the religion is no longer followed. It's the same in the West. So the concept of love in English is deeply impacted by Christian theology. So the word love and what it means in English is not a universal of languages, but in English, it's been, its meaning is deeply shaped by Christianity. So the language that we speak has been shaped by faith, even if you're a secular person. And I think something similar happens in Islam as well. So um, Islamic anti-Semitism can be called, come cultural anti-Semitism. So there's a, a disposition of antipathy of prejudice against the Jews that is no longer um, it's no longer necessarily religious, but it's become part of the culture. It's driven by religion. And that's the same in the West, you know, that, that Christian anti-Semitism has, has helped shape a cultural anti-Semitism. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a serious problem. Um, and I think that's true not just with, with um, anti-Semitism, it's true in attitudes to women, that Islam's treatment of women causes a kind of misogynistic um, ill treatment of women that's part of Middle Eastern cultures uh, can even spill over into Christian communities. Uh, so there, there's this um, complex relationship between the religion over time. I once used a metaphor, it's a bit like a ship with a compass. You know, the ship is traveling all over the ocean and every now and again, someone looks at the compass and says, we should go that way. And I think religion has that effect. 
relationship to culture. Religion is the compass and the ship is the culture. And cultures are independent of the compass, but from time to time they get reshaped by it. And so that's that's what's happened. Uh, into, and so even when people become secular, the culture can still influence them. It takes a really deliberate effort to cut those ties and to turn away from them. Right. Now, in the West, we've seen a fair amount of postmodernism and a combination of, and I don't want to sound too polemical, but what you would probably call cultural Marxism or and this, this notion that essentially the, that the Western civilization or the North Atlantic West, which I would include Australia in, in part of that, even though geographically it's not connected, but is that we've kind of become unmoored from our, our, our biblical values, our, our history. And does that make us more vulnerable to, uh, you know, Islamic anti-Semitism? Oh, and, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. In, on several accounts, um, I mentioned that the the desire of the sort of Mar Marxist cultural Marxism to see the world in terms of oppressors and victims, um, a sort of black and white view of the hu of human nature, um, uh, has the effect that Muslims are treated as in the victim class. And so, a, a symptom of that, for example, is. The, uh, the difficulty that the British authorities have had coming to terms with uh, sex trafficking of non-Muslim girls by predominantly Muslim gangs. Yeah. Um, and again and again, it's turned out that um, the police were really struggling to identify the, the roots of the problem because they, they were trained to see Muslims as victims. But in fact, it was white, often Christian girls that were the victims, which just didn't fit their worldview. So I think there's, there's that treating Islam as a victim. So and then you, if you, to expose, um, you know, Islamic anti-Semitism on a Quranic basis, it's like a violation of the victimhood of Muslims. You know, it's a, it's a sort of violent act that can't be, can't be allowed. There are other more subtle problems too. The West, the West view of the human person has become degraded. And we, we basically see, instead of seeing human beings as made in the image of God, a biblical perspective, we see them as... Um, able to self-improve and in need of guidance um, that through education, we can be progressing this progressive worldview of the human person. It's actually very similar to the Islamic worldview that human beings are basically good, but easily led astray and they need a firm hand of guidance, whether it comes in the form of a Marxist state or Islamic Sharia, you know. And so there's a kind of a, an alignment of worldviews of uh, how, how the world is made up. And Islam has is finding some resonance in the secularized West. I think the the Western worldview, for example, its view of the human person is is um, is is in disarray, and we're struggling really to to understand where we fit in the world and how how we should see human beings. And Islam has a very strong uh, response to that that gap. And and I think that's one reason why some Western people are converting to Islam. They're finding they're finding a re resolution to some of the inherent contradictions that the Western um, Western societies have have fallen into philosophical problems that we've fallen into. Right. Now, before I, I'm going to ask uh, one more question before we close it out, because I, I but before I do that, one of the things I would like to do is figure out a way to show uh, a copy of or the book that you are um, most recent, the most recent, there it is. I, uh, the Quran and its biblical reflexes is investigations into the ge genesis of a religion. I just want to make it clear. If you look up there, it says last purchased June 9th, 2021. I purchased it yesterday and it should be <laughs> delivered to my home sometime tomorrow. You know, a lot of the times when people ask these, you know, post these things, they'll say, oh, well, I purchased my copy. Well, I've got proof, but, um, do you, do you think that this, or maybe two more questions is, uh, do you think that this is a powerful book that Christian leaders can use to help counter uh, some of the submission that Christians have exhibited towards uh, uh, Islam? And also, how do you deal with the challenge of being Islamophobic or, or of being accused of Islamophobic? Because one of the questions that I have is, how is it that you haven't been canceled yet? How did you do that? I think, uh, yeah, so I'll take the second one first. I think it's important to be factual and gracious 
and to be very careful not to be inflammatory. Um, just to use one example, um, uh, an inflammatory example, um, Muhammad married a six-year-old girl and consummated the marriage when she was nine. Um, it's a disturbing incident. Now, um, I, I would certainly gladly talk about that with people and explain it and say it's problematic. It has an effect that in Islamic societies, um, there's in effect sometimes not really a minimum age of marriage for girls. Um, this is a real problem. But um, what would be a mistake would be to say Muhammad was a pedophile. I think that's really, it adds nothing to the discussion. It doesn't explain anything. Um, it's uh, unhelpful. Um, so you, um, I understand why in anger and hurt, people might say things like that, but it's, it's, it's important to be objective and clear and, and gracious. Um, I, I find Solzhenitsyn's really uh, advice very good where he said that he, he discovered in the gulag that the line between good and evil runs down every human heart. And to have that, that perspective, uh, not to demonize others, to avoid stereotypes, nevertheless, to speak about patterns um, that exist. The other thing I'd say about the Islamophobe label is just to have a thick skin towards it. I mean, it's, a, it's an attempt to intimidate and silence people. So I wouldn't buy into that. Um, so coming back to my book, and by the way, if someone's interested in the, the Revelation book that you spoke of earlier, it's been reissued with a new title, Which God? So that's the one to look for. That book that you mentioned, uh, the Quran and its biblical reflexes, I really wrote to do the academic heavy spade lifting around the issue of why is there so much Bible in the Quran? And what is the biblical root in the Quran? Is there a root? And just to, as a summary of my answer, what I argue is that um, the Quran uses a lot of biblical stuff, but it doesn't comprehend it. And its theology is very different from biblical theology. So I conclude that it's more like demolishing a house and reusing building materials to build a mosque. You know, it's not a continuation of the previous house. It's an appropriation, um, a repurposing. So um, I think I argue in that book that Islam is, is repurposed Christian materials and Jewish materials, but it doesn't really own them. And so it's wrong to say, unlike Christianity, I would say Christianity arose out of Judaism, very clearly so. But Islam didn't, in a similar sense, arise out of Christianity and, and Judaism. And that's been a mistake of Christians down the ages. They've wanted to see it in those terms. And it's, I think it's misled them. And it's caused them to have a, a, a biased view of, of the Quran. And I think a really uh, objective analysis of the Quran sees Islam as a fascinating and interesting theological construct, but not one that is um, built on biblical foundations. And it, despite all the apparent similarities, it's deceptive. So that book uh, explains that in detail. So it is academic, but for a person that really wants to get to the root of this issue of how should a Christian understand the biblical content in the Quran, it gives a... I think a very clear and I hope strongly argued um, view that um, the Bible and Islam don't share commonality. It's wrong to speak of an Abrahamic um, uh, partnership or family. There isn't a family tree of religions in which Islam, Christianity and Judaism are all on the tree. Um, and so I commend that to people. This is a really a core, absolutely root issue in this whole uh, concern about the relationship between the three faiths. Thank you so much. I want to thank Reverend Dury for his presentation today. It was enlightening, bracing, challenging, and at the same time, arenic and gracious. And I also want to thank Patrick for doing the, uh, the technical work associated with this webinar. And I want to thank everyone who showed up for this presentation. And presentations uh, from folks like Reverend Dury have been profoundly helpful to our work at Canvas Partnership for Christians and Jews. I ask you to send our emails around to other supporters in your church communities who would be interested in this. This webinar is gonna be posted on YouTube. I think this is a crucially important subject and I wanna uh, thank you and say goodbye and have a, a good afternoon or evening or day, wherever you are. Amen and hallelujah. Thank you.